Good evening. Um, the title of this is Bruce's Parable, and uh, it's about uh, the film that's not on anymore behind, <laughs> is it? Uh, oh, it's just starting now. Urban Turban, a moving picture. And I take moving to have a double meaning. And I think that Bruce McLean's work is a parable of British art over the last almost 50 years. It begins in Scotland, and so many British artists are Scottish. We're prejudiced about Scots in England, especially if one, they come from Glasgow, two, they have a strong accent, and three, dare I say, a bit wee. Excuse me? A bit wee, a bit small. Somebody told me you never trust anyone using the word we. <laughs> In which case, we expect them to be working class. This seemed to fit with the humour of Bruce's early work. <laughs> but he's not working class. His father was an architect. In those days, in the mid-60s, it tended to be quite middle class and upper class Scots who came to study south of the border. Um, Bruce came to study sculpture at St. Martin's College of Art from 63 to 66 in the heyday of Antony Caro's formalist sculpture course that produced the then new generation of British sculptors um, and the McAlpine gift to the Tate in 1971. Philip King, David Annesley, Scott, Bolas and Tucker they were all shown at the White Chapel and bought by Alistair McAlpine of Sir Robert McAlpine and Sons. So we're already in the world of architects and property developers. McAlpine gave his collection to the Tate in 1971, where it lives mostly in the Tate storage. The Arts Council moved their work out to the Yorkshire Sculpture Park near Wakefield years ago. <laughs> of course, that was bringing sculpture home to the Yorkshire of Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth, David Hockney, and that more contemporary YBA, Damien Hurst. Art that labels itself British never takes off properly as part of the international art world. Sir Anthony Caro had more international class than his students. He was supported by the US art critic Clement Greenberg, the doyen of formalism, the Museum of Modern Art and the Cold War. I always think of Greenberg's formalism as meaning shut up boys and let me do the talking. <laughs> Greenberg was a Trotskyist in the 1930s and most of the artists in his circle were in the WPA, Works Progress Administration, lefties in the 1930s, became what was called commie bastards after 1945. <laughs> they were mostly Jewish, and being Jewish was a cardinal sin as far as the Roman Catholic House on American Activities Committee was concerned. Doing the research for Picasso, Peace and Freedom at Tate Liverpool a few years ago, I found Alfred Barr's papers defending MoMA, should it be called in front of, should it, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, be called in front of the House on American Activities Committee around 1952. It seems that it was a real possibility. Non-objective art is a form of iconoclasm. Alfred Barr's Picasso political files also contained a press cutting from the same period of an 8 a.m. communion breakfast at St. Patrick's Cathedral, just around the corner on Park Avenue from MoMA, where the nice Mr. McCarthy gave an anti-communist lecture to 3,000 good Catholic boys in the New York police force. Picasso sent ceramics to New York to be auctioned to support the defense of Dr. Barsky the surgeon for the Abraham Lincoln Brigade during the Spanish Civil War, whose father founded the Beth Israel Hospital in New York. 
He was investigated from 1946 on and accused and found guilty in 1947 of receiving funds from communist sources by the House on American Activities Committee. This was only a year or two after the liberation of Auschwitz. Greenberg amazingly persuaded the US and the Museum of Modern Art that abstract art, non-objective art, a form of iconoclasm was patriotic and safe Caro's course at St. Martin's followed Greenberg's formalism. A whole issue of Studio International, edited by the assistant editor, Charles Harrison, was devoted to the course at St. Martin's. Are you okay with this so far? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Absolutely. But the times they were are changing. St. Martin's had also employed John Latham, who was sacked for eating a copy of Clement Greenberg's Art and Culture, <laughs> the remains of which, distilled in acid, are now in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I, I actually, I don't remember John Latham ever attending any of uh, Clement Greenberg's demonstrations on smoking. And he, he lectured, but he did, did more lighting cigarettes and smoking and sort of didn't actually say very much. But I don't remember John Latham ever being there. I also didn't like him very much, but I don't remember him actually being at the lectures. But he, he did chew up the book. Oh, no, no, he did do that. I, he chewed the book up, but I, I didn't chew the book up. I was there, but I went to the pub. And when I came back, they chewed the book up. It's all, it was all over. But I, I was quite, I, I was amazed that he, John Latham used to come in and work in the evenings to taught in the evening classes. Right. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm digressing, but I mean, I don't remember there having been any confrontation between Latham and Greenberg. And, and Latham, although he, 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 he stumbled a bit and stuttered a bit, he, he could be very articulate when, he, when, when required. I was talking about the times they were changing, yeah. you know, from the Greenberg car in yeah. uh, Charles Harrison position. St. Martin's had also employed John Latham. Um, and Alexander Trochai. And the young Barry Flanagan with his sand ropes and sacking, and Alexander Trochi, the, the Scottish writer, junkie, and friend of William Burroughs. Yep. Uh, professional, he was a professional heroin addict. Yeah. State controlled. But he managed to write a book or two. He did? Yeah. He was very interesting. Yes, I, uh, I tried to read one of them, but I wasn't very <laughs> successful. The later students included a rowdy bunch of foreigners, including Jan Dibitz from the Netherlands, David Lamelis from Argentina, Richard Long from Bristol, and Gilbert and George from the Dolomites via Munich and Totnes in Devon. Nineteen sixty nine knows installation. Caro gave this new g -g -g generation a hard time. Um, that was a reference. Demanding his kind of art. <laughs> Photographs of the time show a physical resemblance between Bruce McLean and members of the Who, the animals and the small faces. <laughs> Big noses. Yeah. Um, when attitudes become form, um, I got upset about. Uh, this is the wrong cover. This is the second cover. This is an original cover. This, this is, is the Harrison the, one. The ICA one. Yeah. Yeah, that's the ICA one. Um, this is the bum one. You're not in this one. I am. Yeah, yeah, but. Uh, uh, I was uh, dealing with England, so I used, I've got both of them, but uh, I used the ICA one, which is less seen. I first came across Bruce when I worked at the ICA in August 1969 on the now legendary exhibition When Attitudes Become Form. Charles Harrison, Cambridge and the Courtauld, with some sort of family link to the Bloomsbury Group, had started to plan an exhibition around young British sculptors at the ICA. The ICA had money problems and they jumped at the offer of When Attitudes Become Form, curated by Harold Zaman, 
for the Kunsthalle in Bern in April 1969. Most importantly, the exhibition was financed generally, generously by the US tobacco corporation, Philip Morris. According to Francis Stoner Saunders, who played The Piper in a very important book about post-war Europe, it, uh, Philip Morris was a channel for CIA funding. Charles Harrison was allowed to add his artist to the long to the original when attitudes become form list that uh, had included both the original show had included both Richard Long and Bruce McLean, but had not yet included Victor Bergin and Rudolf Lowe. They were brought in by Charles Harrison. The Dusseldorf dealer, Conrad Fisher, worked with the ICA, and we mustn't confuse the ICA with CIA. <laughs> Uh, why, in, why not? Might be the same yeah, thing. The same or, or MCM for that matter. <laughs> uh, What's MCM? Michael Craig Martin. Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Or somebody called it MCI. MCIA. Um, yes, yeah. yes. The installation team in the office. Um, yeah, the Dusseldorf dealer, Conrad Fisher, worked with the ICA installation team in the office I shared with them and say because I was setting up I set up the first bookshop at the ICA uh, and Seyman the first uber curator arrived at tea time on the evening of the opening just in time to make his speech although it's always credited to Seyman it was very much um, uh, following Conrad Fisher wasn't he yeah um, Harrison did not add Gilbert and George, but they stole the show by turning up at the opening with gold paint on their hands and faces. McLean, Richard Long, Dibbitz and Lamelis were all part of the group of younger artists around St. Martin's who became part of Conrad Fisher's development of conceptual art. And this is an early show of Gilbert and George at the Stedelijk in Amsterdam. Um, yeah, it's quite clear, you can read it. Conrad Fisher's list of artists. Um, as you can see, this is from a Studio International interview with him, which I think is really interesting. And it shows the artists he gave the first one-man shows to. Did he give you your first one-man show? Yeah, in the greatest gallery in the world. Yeah. Yeah. The greatest gallery in the world. Yeah. He had a very that's what he's, that's what he's, uh, but when he said that on the phone, then of course it was that. If you say something is something, then that's what it is. And it was to me. Yeah. So how could I refuse? Well, he, he was a member of capitalist realism as Richter and Polka. And uh, he tells the funny story of going in 1967 to see Ileana Sonnebend yeah. in Paris yeah. with the drawings and, and works by yeah. Richter, Polka and himself. And he explained to Ileana Sonnebend that they were um, pop artists, which is how they thought of themselves. And Ileana just burst out laughing and uncontrollably at the idea of German pop artists. Yeah, I know. And she dropped all the work on the floor. And I think that was a first insight that he should start a gallery. Was that, was that 67? In 60, early 67. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and it, it there was no such thing as a German artist then, actually. Yeah. There it, wasn't. I mean, we. Yeah. The only other time I've seen the German artists, they surfaced then with the strategy get arts thing in Edinburgh. Well, you as see? you can see, Conrad emphasised showing, giving first shows, uh, first one-person shows to British and US artists, the first European shows. And I've come to think more and more of the conceptual art period as being the years of the Vietnam War from 67 to 73. And I think a lot of American artists were very sympathetic to coming to Europe and showing in Germany because of their uh, dislike of the Vietnam War. Um, Uh, and 
I got very interested in this little triangle in Northern Europe, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, and down to Cologne, Dusseldorf in Northern Germany. And this became very much the center of the museums and the galleries who were passing around this group of artists from, from Conrad, and sometimes quite small towns and little museums. And I lectured on this quite a lot. And this photograph just about this map just about shows to you Norwich as being... <laughs> <laughs> you managed to squeeze that in, I know. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah uh, cunning, tr cunning trick. One of my students made a, a, a carrier bag that shows Norwich. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Dusseldorf and everything. Did you direct the design of this particular map? No, no, it was their <laughs> idea, but they'd heard me lecturing with that map. Um, but to make a carrier <laughs> bag of it, I like it. So Conrad's list of artists, the carrier bag made for East 2009 from that idea. And um, my PhD student was Sophie Richard, who was uh, from Luxembourg, and she worked with me for four or five years on her PhD. Uh, and very sadly, she had a baby after finishing her PhD and died six weeks later with a brain aneurysm after the birth. And so I worked with her PhD to turn it with uh, Riding House into the book called Unconcealed. Um, and in it, we have uh, this list. Uh, this is part of the, uh, you know, stuff that I completed for, for that book before it was published. Um, and the dealer curators uh, of the main shows of conceptual art through from 66 to 77. Um, and so this kind of sense of museum shows that were being actually curated by art dealers who were involved with this whole radical movement of that period are in blue and the ones that Conrad Fisher was doing uh, are in brown. The Draped Figure, 1969. I haven't got any notes against this, but I assume 69. that it has to do with more and um, the Elgin marbles. N there's nothing to do with the Elgin marbles, no. Yeah. Wasn't more to do with the figures of the Elgin marbles, in a way, you know. There's a bit of a, a, bit of a fascination with drapery at one point. Yeah. Not me. And The Fallen Warrior. Good, great piece. Wonderful piece, my favourite. Well, that, well, that's the only thing. That's the only piece I really made, which is a, a ref, referencing Moore, because it was the, it was based on that piece that he actually made called Fallen Warrior, mm. which I which I liked the piece, but I couldn't understand why the, why the figure fell on a plinth. Was it you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Can't tell the shoe, the boot. <laughs> Can't see the face. The fist is a. Oh, yeah. Oh, get what I'm falling on is what, <laughs> what I'm actually, warriors. you know what I'm actually falling on is not a plinth, it's a piece of minimal sculpture I was making at the time that I got fed up with. In London, oh, never mind, I was lost. I can Bruce see. Was shown, no, don't write that down. Was shown by Situation Gallery in a little courtyard off Brook Street called the Coach and Horses Yard. You know, no, 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 it wasn't, it was called, um, oh dear, I've got something wrong. It wasn't the Coach and Horses Yard, it was, caught, uh, it was, uh, Horseshoe Yard. Horseshoe Yard, oh. right. I must change. Quite that. near a brothel called the Office. What? There was a, bro a brothel around Next. there. Next. And then down to the Yates Wine Lodge. <laughs> wow. But that's another whole and, uh, episode. And Jimi Hendrix lived just around the corner. He, he lived, in, yeah. 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 Two young dealers, Anthony de Kerdron and Robert Self, ran situation. They also showed Hamish Fulton, Bob Law, John Blake, and they organised Gilbert and George's first postcard sculpture yeah. exhibition. Sure, William Wegman. How Postcards so are important, aren't they? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. I have been given some by a, a friend here to pass around later on, shall we? Now, postcards are quite important because it was a, it was a, because it wasn't 
face, selfies or Instagram or all yeah. this stuff, people used to phone each other up in different countries and people used to send each other postcards. Have you made any new pieces today, for example? Yes, three, you might say, oh, I'm thinking about one. And I could go off to Korea, or go to New York or Dusseldorf. It was a quite good ways of communicating stuff quickly. Catherine Lacey was their assistant and she became Catherine Kinley, a curator at Tate Britain. Conrad always referred to Robert and Anthony as the gangsters. I missed that, sorry. Conrad always referred to Robert and Anthony as the gangsters. Yeah, yeah. Did you hear? I knew that, yeah. And they were rogues, only just surviving, always on the lookout for a quick deal. Yeah. Yeah. But they, what they actually managed to do was they actually made a lot of situations. It was called situations. It wasn't called a gallery. They, was, they hated the word gallery. It's called mm. situations. And they actually funded films I made. They funded other people's things. And they didn't do it for any other reason as part to fund them, to make it happen. And uh, I think that was, it was quite interesting. And they're kind of written out of history slightly yeah. because they had a kind of... Um, one was posh and one was not. One was a son of a high-class Puerto Rican whore, or lady of the, apparently, and the other was connected to Edward the Seventh. It was a bit of a funny mixture, the pair of them. Mm. Did you knew that? No, I didn't know. Well, oh, you know it now. Well, yeah, and and yeah, they, there's a lot right. of. Um, they they funded it by selling sort of not very good magritte. Which one was which? Uh, who was the Puerto Rican? Which one? Which story? one had the glasses? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> no um, Anthony was the one that looked like Fidel Castro with a military outfit on, yeah. and Robert was the one with the black moustache and yeah. hair and the so handmade shoes. Robert was the whore's son. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so Anthony, he so he said. Anthony de Curdle had uh, royal links. Well, I think his father, or grandfather, was some sort of something to do with Edward the Seventh. Yeah. Mm. You didn't know that? No, no, I didn't know that. There's, um, a, there's a lot more I could tell you, but I'll probably be done for slander, so I better not say. <laughs> or liable. But they were good, because they actually, a, a lot of Americans, and William Wegman showed there, and made some videos there, which they funded, and um, Howard Selena, do you remember him? Yeah, yeah, I forgot him. Yeah, he showed there. Oh, good. Well, they were sort of dodgy, in a way. This is King for a Day, which was at the Tate, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, in 1972, Bruce McLean de delivered a retrospective, King for a Day, in a series of events, including Latham and Boyce, curated by Michael Compton at the Tate Gallery. It had also been shown at Situation earlier, and a catalogue booklet was published. It was the t full text was published in the New York magazine Avalanche. Yeah. Willoughby Sharp, and the exhibition was 999 copies of the booklet, which you can see here. Do you know what that piece was about? Not really, no. No, no. Most people don't. It was the idea was to make a work, which was the catalogue, and the catalogue was the work. Because everyone used to say, oh, I've got a big show in um, München Gladbach. Oh, uh, have you got a catalogue? And it was, the catalogue was more important to artists, it seemed, than the, the actual work. I mean, and in a sense, it is true, because most of the work was disseminated through photographs, which were in catalogues. But I, saw, I, I, I also had heard that Robin Denny, minimalist painter, had had a retrospective at the Tate in the 60s sometime, and when he was quite young, and, and he had this retrospective, and he was, he was climbing up the charts of success, had the retrospective, was finished as an artist. He hasn't suffered since, really. He's still alive. He just died recently. So I thought, if I want to remove myself from the art world, which I did, I don't like the art world. I'm not interested in the art world. I'm interested in sculpture. I'm interested in painting and dancing, and also, but I'm not interested in art or the art world. I want to remove myself. I, had, I constructed a, a retrospective. And I think you should start at the end, and, and this is the end of my <laughs> life. And what, that was why I did it. So, and the idea was that people would come and buy the catalogue, which they started doing there, and the show would be removed, and that would be the end of me, which it was. But I, I invented this piece in 1969, the night I went to a, a party with Charles, at Charles Harrison's house with Seth Ziegler and Lucy Lippard, 
and we all went into this room and we went, oh, oh, we don't want to be here. This is the hot spot in London, conceptual art. Oh, oh, don't want to be here. And I, I decided that was the end of it for me. And I didn't realize that this, almost the same time, Zieglab had decided it was the end of it for him. And he went eventually to live in um, Holland. Yeah, we, Paris, with a, with that, Holland. Did you see that last show that was of his, Beyond Conceptual Art? Did you see that in Holland? Mm, yeah, Absolutely yeah. fantastic show. Yeah, yeah. A fa fabulous show. Textiles. But he gave it up that night, mm. more or less, with me. We both thought, this is not on. 1972 was also the new art show at the Hayward Gallery, yeah. curated by Anne Seymour, a young Tate curator who the year before had curated the McAlpine gift to the Tate. Uh, she was assisted in the new art show with an arts council, by an arts council officer, a junior, called Nick Sorota. <laughs> the exhibition was a great success, despite being limited to British artists at the moment of the radical internationalism confirmed by Documenta 5 mm. in Castle. Um, that was the new art show, was that 72? Yeah. Were you in it? Uh, no, I turned it down. That's what I was wondering. But, what but, you but, just but, said. but, but, in fact, they put, uh, they put us in the catalogue having t to say that we turned it down, so we were actually in it without being in it, which is actually <laughs> nice. quite good. I wasn't, I wasn't, that wasn't the intention, by the way. The intention was to try to do the, the new art show was taking place in the Hayward, and we wanted our contribution to be in a building around the corner and to be people to, people to have to pay money to get into it and they did, wouldn't, didn't want to do that so, so we said we don't want to do it then so we didn't you were breaking the rules bruce yeah this is actually 1971 a sculpture on my shoulder on thursday the 5th of july 1973 my diary records that i spent the afternoon taking conrad fisher to galleries for nigel greenwood to look at painters for his 1973 Prospect exhibition. In the early evening, we were drinking in Yates's Wine Lodge behind Bond Street with yeah. Gilbert and George and Gordon Byrne, the journalist. At 9 p.m., we went to Sotheby's second sale of contemporary art, organized by Thilo von Wartsdorf, who's actually uh, the nephew of the Queen of the Netherlands, I didn't know that till recently. Mm -hmm. um, just as this sale was about to begin, Mick and Bianca Jagger were ushered into through a side door, and Jagger bid for lot 102, Swinging London 67 by Richard Hamilton, number 14 of an edition of 70 of an etching of Jagger handcuffed to Robert Fraser. 11 p.m. We went to dinner at Mark Antonio's an Italian restaurant next to Situation Gallery <laughs> with Gilbert and George, Conrad, Robert Self, Anthony de Curdrell, Bruce McLean and Nigel Greenwood, drinking flaming, flaming Sambucos with toasted coffee beans <laughs> to the early hours of the morning. I had a terrible head the next I day. I don't seem to remember much about that, really. Goodness me. Uh, Bound to Fail, uh, Bruce Nauman, Feet of Clay, the 66, 67 photographs. Uh, one of the beautiful ones is Bruce Nauman, Fountain, 66, 67. Great piece. An artist I think McLean had a sense of working in parallel with was another Bruce, Bruce Nauman. Yeah. Nauman was born in 1941 and McLean in 1944, and there are parallels between Bruce McLean's early work and Nauman's. Uh, you, you, know, you know that I met him once. Did you? I was invited to dinner by Nick Sirota. It was him and I and Nick Sirota to, the, uh, to uh, Caprice. It was the dullest evening I've ever spent. <laughs> I thought it'd be really exciting because I mean I quite like his work. I mean I didn't. And I he didn't was know. so handsome. Wasn't uh, yeah, he? yeah. He's not as handsome. Not as handsome as me though. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, maybe. But anyway, we went to this, we went to the, he was bald at the time, and he had it all yeah, gone grey. Yeah. But we went to this meeting, and Nick sort of had this idea, it was an idea that doesn't work, you know, they'll, they'll really get on, these two. The two Bruce's. Because they're both called Bruce, and they've done things about Henry Moore. <laughs> anyway, it, it, was, it was quite an interesting evening, because he, he didn't say a bloody word, Bruce Melvin. And I, eventually, I, and I actually got, I was quite impressed in the end, because I said, well, what are you going to do? What are you, you? What are you doing now after dinner? Are you going to go back to America tomorrow? He said, "Yeah." Oh, are you working on a show or anything? He said, no, "No, no, no. I don't know what I'm doing." He said. And I thought that's quite interesting. Is the first artist I've ever met, and only ever since, admitted that he didn't know what he was doing or what he was going to do. And I thought he must be quite good. I thought. <laughs> And I was quite impressed, that was, but that was just at the end of the evening he said that. I mean, up until this kind of, I don't know what I'm doing, it was like a whole disaster. It was not, Nick Sirota was trying his terrible best to start to sort of, you know, sort things out, have another glass of, or have another half a glass or something. Yeah, I must put that in, I forgot about that one. The silence of Bruce Norman. <laughs> this was the piece that uh, was on the cover of the catalogue. Yeah, that's, the si that's in situation. That's from 1971. That's in the situation space. What was the idea with this piece? I'm uh, trying to levitate. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're off the floor. Well, I'm actually off the floor. I'm wedged <laughs> between the head and the... I am actually off the floor. But I'm wedged between two structures, two pieces. It's a sculpture made with my body. Uh, I added the Nauman corridor pieces. Great. With that sort of use of the body. He was good looking then. Yeah, he was lovely, wasn't he? Did you know him then? A little bit. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> now <laughs> corridor. Um, uh, and then, um, yeah. And the McLean. Oh, what a great piece. Plinth pieces. Well, I'm obviously sick to death with this bloody thing. Yeah. I'd love to see a, a joint show of Bruce Nauman's pieces. Well, Robert and, Self, Robert and, Self, and your pieces. Well, Robert from Self, the early Robert Self came to my house one night with his shoes undone, handmade shoes undone, because he didn't want to die with his shoes on. And he came to my house, and my mother-in-law was there, and she strolled sort of like that, and she said, she said, "What are you doing here?" And he said, "I've come to talk to Bruce." He said, "Yes, but why? What are you actually up to?" And he said, I've got this idea, because he'd moved into that new space in Honcha Venison Yard, remember? And he said he wanted to do a show with Bruce Norman and me. And it was going to happen, but then it didn't, because the whole thing went to pieces. I mean, quite interesting. The early work would have been quite interesting, some of it. I think there's uh, a lot in common. You were both... But we didn't know, we didn't 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 know, know each other's existence yeah. at all. Yeah. And so... Wait a the Swiss drawings, so the Swiss, yeah, these, that's Norman, isn't it? Yeah. But I think there's, um, yeah. And that was his first uh, show with Conrad Fisher. PMJ itself, that's right. When situation closed, Robert Self opened a gallery in Covent Garden mm -hmm. And I worked with him on a One Artist, One Day project. Yeah. And the poster was designed by Gary Chitty. Nice was one. it? Yeah. Uh, Self also produced, with the S Scottish Arts Council, uh, the famous Victor Bergen poster that 7% of our population owns 24% of our wealth. And that's uh, mine, which is, was in the Dear Linda, but it's a bit battered over the years. Bruce taught at Croydon School of Art from 1966 to 76. Yeah. And it was at that time he developed Nice Style, the world's first pose band. Well, I, I developed that after I gave up being, a, being in the ball with the art world, and I worked with students at Mason School of Art. It was amazing students that we did it in the sculpture department. We were in the sculpture. I was teaching sculpture at Mason, and, right. we, and they didn't want to be part of um, the, the same old thing. So we formed a group there because I was invited down by a man called Paul Richards, who had seen 
uh, me do an interview sculpture with Gilbert and George at St. Martin's where I was impersonating other sculptures. And he thought it would be quite good to get me down to teach there. So I went down and we um, then formed this. That was about 71, 72, was it? 69. 69. 70, yeah. Right. And uh, I had the names Paul Richards, yeah, Barry Chitty, that's it. and Ron Carr. And Robert Carr, yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's Bruce right. and I staff continued to show with Robert Self in Covent Garden after situation closed. They also continued working closely with Robert Self at his gallery in Newcastle and then at his new gallery in Cork Street. They also performed at the Royal College of Art in Rosalie Goldberg's programme and featured in her subsequent articles and publications on performance. Rosalie now runs Performer in New York, the big festival of performance art. Yeah, this, was, this wasn't performance art, this was sculpture, and this, that, that, piece, that actual piece was a photograph by Craigie Horsfield. He took a pho that photograph there, was taken by Craigie Horsfield before we'd made the piece, and so the actual piece existed as a photograph. Oh. And that's got Robin in it as well. Yeah, he, he joined, yeah. 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 He, he, was, uh, he was part of the military side of things. Opposite I, I, well, I'm just listening to what you said earlier on. He wasn't military, but he had the shoes and the, you know. But, but that, that, that work was, was they, were all, they were all sculptors, and we're trying to make a sculpture. They performed a garage in the gallery next door in Covent Garden, a joint venture of Kasmin and Conrad, with high up on a Baroque palazzo That's right, yeah. in 1974. Later, Nice style showed at Battersea Art Centre. No, this isn't nice style. This isn't nice style. Right. This is Bill Farlong. Yeah, of Audio Arts, notably yeah. on an academic board, a new procedure. But it wasn't considered to be nice style. No, no it, was, it was me and Bill. Okay. Bill and I. This is about academic this procedures, is yeah. The, the <laughs> uh, the poster, this is Office of Class, isn't it? Um, well, he, was, he, he wasn't, it wasn't actually, he was French, but he wasn't, he was kind of a strange man. Uh, Stéphane, Stéphane Rosé. Right. Of Colonel Blip, reminds me of the, when I first went to Norwich in 1980. One of the technicians would stand to attention whenever he spoke to the principal. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Most of the male staff had been in World War II or done national service. Norwich was saved by Ed Middleditch, who'd get angry and walk out of academic board meetings. He could do this because he'd won an MC, a military cross, in the Ardennes, <laughs> as well as being an RA. Bruce has continued to teach, mainly at the Slade U University College from 85 to 2009. In some ways, I think teaching allowed him some independence from the galleries. It did. It did. It was deliberate. It did. Yeah. We, yeah. As well as being a stimulus to be around young people. Yeah. And it's great teaching. Well, I quite like the notion that uh, Miles Davis changed the bandery. The band just got younger and younger, and he got older and older. There's Robert Self there, that one with the moustache. And there's Bruce talking to him. Yeah, asking if you can lend me a couple of quid to make another film, yeah. There were a number of final pose pieces at Morton's Restaurant in 1974 and 75, including the mailing you sent out to friends. This is the copy I received. I think Gilbert and George and the Situation Dinners, like the one I attended in 73, influenced the development of Bruce McLean's Nice Style, the world's first pose band. After a show with Barry Barker's Commercial Gallery in Bloomsbury in July 79 and at Gordon Matter Clark's Kitchen in New York and a touring project to Glasgow, Edinburgh, the Arnolfini in Bristol, Bruce McLean appeared, reappeared as a painter of big colourful paintings with Anthony Dauphé in the summer of 1971, 1981. Quite a lot happened between the black and white photographs of early Bruce McLean and the nice style and that Dauphé exhibition. I'm running a campaign to put the political history back into contemporary art. The year 1967 was a year of the escalation of the war in Vietnam 
and the fear of nuclear war against the USSR across a divided Germany. The internationalism of the artist dealers of the late 60s and early 70s was a response by ordinary people against the financial, military, industrial and political interests that dominate capitalist countries. Conrad Fischer, the Dusseldorf dealer, um, said in an interview in Studio International in February 71, my job was to get artists over here and to bring them into contact with those who lived here. When I was an artist, everything was so far away. Warhol, Liechtenstein, and all those were great unattainable men. And, but when you know them, you can have a beer with them and get rid of your inferiority complex. I insist that the artist has to be there when I show his work. Palermo and Richter, for example, two of the German artists who've exhibited with me, have now been to New York and they felt at home there because they'd already met artists like Andre and Lewitt over here. It's not the artists who are chauvinists, but the institutions. This is a Studio International cover, November 1970, with a demonstration in front of Picasso's Guernica at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, in January 1968, US troops in Vietnam were increased by 10,000, and a US bombing assault on Hu resulted in a massive destruction. In March, women and children were massacred in Mai Le, and this became the subject of an art workers' coalition poster and demonstration in front of Guernica. Uh, uh, with the poster saying, and babies, and babies. This is my photo of the US Embassy in uh, Grosvenor Square. In London, 10,000 demonstrators marched on the US Embassy in March 1968 in Grosvenor Square. Hundreds were injured by the police. Uh, over a thousand police were there under the shadow of the concrete eagle. Marcel Broadhouse starts his Museum of Modern Art Department of Eagles in 1968, and Jagger and Richards went home that evening and wrote Street Fighting Men. In March 1968, there was violent street fighting in Rome and hundreds were injured. The police closed the university for 12 days. And on the 4th of April, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis. From 4th to the 8th of April, 181 US cities were in flames, including Washington and Chicago. 43 people were killed. 2,135 people were wounded and 13,428 arrested. 20,000 federal troops and 40,000 national guards were deployed. Black GIs in Vietnam made over up over 15% of the troops. In April, the Bader Meinhof group were arrested and sentenced to three years prison for firebombing two Frankfurt department stores. And on the 11th of April, an assassination attempt on Rudi Deutsch, uh, the Marxist Socialist Student League leader in West Berlin, led to street battles in the divided city. Uh, but all we know about now is May 68. On the 3rd of May, 40,000 students were locked out of the Sorbonne in Paris. More than 10,000 students fought running battles and built barricades on the left bank, fighting against the police the, and the CRS riot police. Train stations and airports were closed and telephones cut off. A general strike was called on the 14th of May and President de Gaulle fled to Germany for safety. The six-week occupation of Hornsey College of Art started on the 28th of May. Croydon, where Bruce MacLean taught, and Guildford Schools of Art were also occupied. I was at Canterbury and the principal asked, called a meeting to ask us why we weren't demonstrating. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, no, it was it was it was quite interesting. What that happened time. at Croydon? Markham Markham Ed was actually Markham McLaren and Jamie Reed. They were painting students. I was teaching them. They they, they whipped everybody up into a frenzy of uh, 
striking and revolution, which was, I was okay. But they didn't quite get the, they weren't, yeah, I was all right. But, it was three, they, but these three places had interesting courses running in them. And the courses were then um, removed from the curriculum mm -hmm. by the... Uh, the management, the officer uh, class. Somebody up there, yeah. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in Los Angeles on the 5th of June. And the 7th of June, over one million people protested on the streets of Paris. Demonstrators at the Venice Biennale issued a manifesto. What remains for the artists that wages such a war as that in Vietnam, but to make minimal art? Uh, in Venice, the Argentine artist David Lemelis installed a bureau titled the Office of Information about the Vietnam War. Belgrade University was occupied. Documenta 4 opened to protests between the organizers and the Social Democratic Student Organization. The latter complained that there were only two political artists out of 117 exhibitors, Ed Keenholz and Avid Felstrom. Dutch artists occupied the Rembrandt Night Watch in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Just imagine all this happening around you. On the 24th of June, the Poor People's Washington March. August, the Nigeria's Biafra famine started. Soviet, East German, Polish, Hungarian, Bulgarian troops moved into Czechoslovakia on the 20th of August. Senator Eugene McCarthy campaigned for the US presidency with Picasso's peace dove. Hubert Humphreys defeated McCarthy and McGovern at the Chicago Democratic Convention, the 29th of August. Jean Genet and Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs are photographed together at the convention. On the streets, 10,000 people were attacked by 5,000 National Guards and 12,000 police on the orders of Mayor Daley. 250 people were injured. Norman Mailer wrote Miami and the Siege of Chicago in a month. Bonnet Newman sh showed Mayor Daley's lace curtain, a painted grid of barbed wire splashed with red paint representing blood. On the 5th of October, the first major Republican demonstrations in Londonderry started with what is, is a euphemistically called the Troubles in Northern Ireland. There were riots at the Mexico Olympics in October where Tommy Smith and John Carlos gave the Black Power salute from the podium. On the 5th of November, Richard Nixon won the US election and Russian tanks entered Prague. We think it's bad now, but it can get worse. These memories never went away from my generation, but we've watched them being suppressed. Andres Bricks and the Daily Mirror, 1976 was another important year. In February, the Daily Mirror published the front page article, What a Load of Rubbish, about the Tate Gallery's purchase of Carl Andres Bricks in 1972. In July 76, the painter R.B. Kitai organized the human clay at the Hayward Gallery. This is his... Uh, uh, summer in central Paris of 1939 with uh, Walter Benjamin and Hannah Arendt. Uh, it gathered together the figurative painters in London and named them the School of London. Many of the key figures of the school were from emigre families. The exhibition was a great success and Kitai and David Hockney mounted a campaign for a return to life drawing as the basis of art education. <coughs> They attracted a younger generation of critics, including Timothy Hyman and Peter Fuller. Um, uh, and I, Andrew Brighton and I did uh, in Nottingham towards another picture, which led to the state of British art debate at the ICA in 78. And I've remained attracted to the development of this progressive position of painting after conceptualism, what I call my double helix model of art history. A new spirit of painting was held at the Royal Academy. 
but a new force came into the art world by 1980, 81. A new spirit in painting held at the Royal Academy in January 81 was curated by Norman Rosenthal, Christos Jacomides from Berlin and Nicholas Sirota. This is the list of painters. It brought all the new German painters to the RA alongside the new US painters Schnabel, de Kooning, Warhol and older figures like de Kooning, Warhol, Stella, Guston and Morley. The British painters were Bacon, Freud, Auerbach, Hockney, Hodgkin, Kittai, coming out of that. And you've guessed it, Bruce McLean. I wasn't a painter then. You weren't a painter then? What did you show? That's interesting. What did you show? <coughs> Well, I don't know why they invited me to be in the show. I mean, I was, I was making drawings, coloured drawings, basically, which were not paintings. There's a difference between making a painting. I think these, these guys make paintings. I don't make paintings. I have made paintings. I wasn't making paintings now. They were drawings, which actually livened things up a bit, but it was kind of dismissed at the time. The commercial dealer gallery at the centre of this movement was Anthony Dauphé. Bruce found himself in a spanking, shiny art world of large-scale, coloured, expressionist paintings. No more Booker's artwork selling for five or ten pounds, no more art language, no more idealism, no more politics, no more performance, no more feminism. You needed a major office block for the new paintings mm. in the, uh, uh, or to own your own museum. In 1979, Anne Seymour resigned from the Tate Gallery to marry Anthony Dauphé, the de a dealer who had previously sold the estates of Bloomsbury artists, which enabled him to take on Lucian Freud and Sir William Coldstream. A second Dauphé Gallery opened in 1980, and the couple's first exhibition was Lawrence Wiener, arranged for them by Conrad Fisher. Conrad Fisher, uh, was rumoured to have a 10% share in Dauphé's gallery. Fisher's major artists all moved from the various London galleries to Dauphé's gallery, Boyce, Nauman, Carl André, Gilbert and George, to name but a few. The Dauphé press release for Bruce's exhibition in October 1981 tells us performance art a medium in which he became one of this country's most distinguished exponents, indeed arguably the most distinguished. As everybody knows, the problem with performance art has been that it's not proved a very permanent commodity. The museums and galleries have failed to manage any sustained interest, which among its consequences has meant that Maclean did not get the approbation he deserved. The which? Uh, yeah. uh, the, the acclaim he deserved. However, on the credit side, he almost certainly could not have created the paintings which have brought him to the front of the new wave without this conceptual and performance background. The paintings were exhibited as early as 1977, so those who accuse Bruce McLean of joining the new painting bandwagon should do their homework. That's a Dauphé press release. It's not yeah, well, I didn't jump on a bandwagon, but I was vilified. Everyone hated me for joining the Dauphé gallery. I mean, a lot of problems mm. from, from abroad as well as in this, in this country. Ooh, sold out. Sirota at the Whitechapel Art Gallery led the way in Britain, showing works by the new painters, Marcus Lupertz in 79, mm. Barslitz in 80. He laid down the art historical reference with Max Beckman's triptychs in November 1980 and work by Philip Guston in 82. In 1983, he showed Bruce McLean. Yeah. At the, what was in that show? Was it your early work as well as the paintings or just paintings? But you don't the white chapel there? Yeah. No, I didn't show any of these. I, I mean, four paintings for that show and, and five stone sculptures. Right. I decided not to make, I didn't show the paintings. I didn't, 
I should have done it. Everyone said I should have done, but I didn't. I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. And I've the Tate that. and the Arts Council bought from that show, the White Chapel. Didn't buy anything from the White Chapel. They didn't? No. Yeah. May 1979 marked the burial of 1968 with the election of Margaret Thatcher Ooh. as Prime Minister. The Conservative government was helped to win the election by Saatchi and Saatchi's advertising campaign, Labour Isn't Working. In the first three years of Thatcher's government, two million UK jobs were lost. By April 1982, we were at war with Argentina over the Falkland Islands. In March 1984, the closure of 20 pits was announced, the miners' strike began and lasted until March 1985. London galleries showing conceptual art survived on sales to British public collections. London dealers had long dreamed of a really major collector emerging in Britain, and in early 1980, their dream came true in the form of Charles and Doris Saatchi. Any good Charles Saatchi stories, Bruce? No, 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 not really. I said I made a piece about Charles Saatchi's trousers. Of Charles Saatchi's trousers. I made a work about that, and um, I made a work called Another Bad Turn Up. He was wearing these flared trousers at Documenta <laughs> Six or Seven, and the piece was basically about the fact that he was, there was boys over there with an entourage of people, and then there was Charlie Saatchi with his terrible trousers on walking down and then everyone, nobody could work out whether she'd be with the boys entourage or the sash. There's this kind of like, oh, shall we, who, who should we stand next to? Who should, who? This, I'm talking about other artists, by the way. So I made a piece about that. It wasn't an attack on Charlie Satchi, it was an attack on the artists. But uh, Anthony Dolphy was in the audience with Anselm Kiefer and Kiefer said to me, when, when the piece was finished, he said, you'll probably be dead tomorrow. I said, why? He said, you shouldn't make fun of, make fun of Charles Satch. I said, come on, it wasn't about that. He didn't get it. Nobody got it, really. And Charles Satch, didn't get it. But I didn't get it. And that was the end. That was the end for me. One of the many ends, actually. I'm probably a lot of ends at the moment, actually. Help me, Linda, help me. Get a beginning here, Linda. Charles and Doris Satch began... No I'll, tell, no, I'll tell you about Charles Satch. I'll tell you. He was, and this is a true story. I was in the slate. Uh, running the painting department, and, I, and there was a student, the, sh the show, end of year show, and I went in one morning just to make sure everything was okay, and in the studio it was Charles Satchi standing on the phone. And I said, excuse me, you can't use that phone in here, you know, oh, sorry, terribly sorry. I mean, it's completely weird. And I said, only joking. So he got the phone out again, and he, he said, um, now look, Bruce, he said, look, you tell me, who's the best, who are the best students this year? Who do you think are the best artists this year? I said, hang on a minute, you're the bloody expert. You're the one that's making all this and all that. You tell me. So he went to his pocket and he pulled out this piece of paper. And on the piece of paper were the three, and in the correct order, in my opinion, of the best students. I said, oh, you got that right. So I was, I was, I was, I was personally surprised. Yeah. But he's kind of quite a curious character. I, I quite like him in a funny sort of way. But he's, he's, he's kind of nervous. <laughs> They began buying not just one or two new paintings here and there, but entire exhibitions. The Dofid Gallery picked up a lot of the Saatchi patronage. Um, I can remember you, Bruce, in the second week of your show at the Dofid Gallery. Sobbing in, in a corner? What? In 1981. Yeah. Delivering a whole load of new paintings arriving. Yeah. Uh, which I was quite shocked by. By the paintings? Well, the, you know, not only was the big show of all your work, but you were to, by the second week, there were lots of red dots everywhere. Oh, by no, but yeah, week. no, I, I know what happened. He, had, he, he put the show on the wall, yeah? And they, they referred to the gallery as a shop. This is a sort of funny in joke. And I went to the show, and all the stuff was sold. So I said, why are these watch still on the wall if you sold them? He said, well, it's part of the show. I said, well, take them down and put another lot up. And he went, oh. It did, so I like that, but I thought, if you're selling bloody tins of fruit and you don't sell the fruit, you have to start the shelves again. So what, what difference is it? 
By this time... You didn't, didn't like that. I, I, a lot of people didn't like that. You I'd obviously didn't to, like it either. I'd moved out of London. I couldn't afford flat prices or anything. And I got a job at the Midland Group in Nottingham. And I then, after a couple of years there, I took a job at the Scottish Arts Council. But I couldn't tuck myself into the Edinburgh establishment. Uh, and after a year doing research on the Artists International Association, I went to... Norwich School of Art to hide there during the Thatcher years. I watched what was happening to my radical friends. I started to feel that London no longer has the moral authority to rule the rest of the country, and I feel that's very strongly still. Charles and Doris Saatchi appeared in the list of acknowledgements at the front of the New Spirit of Painting catalogue. The exhibition was financed by the Arts Council of the West Germans, and two anonymous private donations. <laughs> if those donations came from people with a financial involvement in the new art, it was an intelligent investment because the exhibition did a great deal to encourage museum purchases and raise the value of the work. Tracing the term the new art reveals the increasing influence on public sector curators some of those curators were in contact with industrialists, bankers, property developers who were all seeking to make London the great European financial capital in competition with Frankfurt. They in turn were served by a new generation of secondary dealers who unlike the first generation of conceptual art dealers were more concerned with money than they were with providing opportunities to young artists. When discussing public funding of the arts in Britain, it's useful to distinguish between two strands. Firstly, grants to public sector galleries and artists through the Arts Council of England. And secondly, purchase grants for public collections. The latter can be seen as the public funding of private dealer galleries, which would expect to receive at least 50% of the purchase price paid. Based in London are Tate's national and international collections of contemporary art, the Arts Council Collection, the British Council Collection, the Contemporary Art Society, the Art Fund, formerly the National Art Collections Fund, the Government Art Collection, Victoria and Albert Museum, and the British Museum. And that's why London's the centre of gallery activity. Public collections of contemporary art in Britain keep confidential the price they pay for art, arguing that this enables the dealers to give them special discounts. My knowledge of dealers suggests the opposite. The dealers use the public collections to establish prices, and those prices are then discounted for private collectors. However, price confidentiality makes it difficult to check the facts. In June 1982, the Tate Gallery announced the formation of the Patrons of New Art with Julian Schnabel's first museum exhibition. Schnabel's meteoric rise had started two years earlier in New York. Mary Boone and Leo Castelli promoted him as New York's answer to the new German and Italian artists. A show for Schnabel at the Tate must have been beyond their wildest dreams. It had taken Castelli almost a decade to achieve a Tate retrospective for Andy Warhol or f and two decades for a Robert Rauschenberg show. With the exception of one remain recent painting purchased by the Tate for its collection, nine of the remaining ten paintings in the exhibition came from the collection of Charles and Doris Saatchi. <laughs> Sometime in 1982, Sirota appointed Charles Saatchi a trustee of the Whitechapel, and Saatchi and Saatchi appeared on the list of financial benefactors of the gallery. In early 1982, Saatchi and Saatchi took over Compton Communications in New York. Charles Saatchi role in supporting the one-man exhibitions for the Tate for Schnabel was a brilliant stroke that ensured him a warm welcome in the top drawer of American society through the social role of museums among the rich and powerful and corporate in the US. In November 1982, a Dauphé Gallery press release was pleased to comment the developing relationship between new art in New York and the Tate Gallery 
This summer, we showed Walking the Dog, one of David Sally's recent pictures. We found our visitors fascinated, although most of them had never seen a Sally work before. The Tate Gallery, already well informed, bought the painting. The year 1983 at the Whitechapel began with Francisco Clemente's exhibition, The Fourteen Stations of the Cross. The Dauphé Gallery also opened a Clemente show on the same evening, and a coach was laid on to take art lovers between the two openings. The Clemente painting at the Whitechapel had been made in New York in the preceding two months, as Mark Francis, now of Gargosian Gallery, his interview with the artists for the Whitechapel <coughs> exhibition leaflet recorded, but they were shown at the Whitechapel courtesy of the collection of Charles and Doris Saatchi. On the 6th of November 1984, the day of Ronald Reagan's re-election as President of the US, Omnibus, the BBC One arts programme, announced the winner of the first Turner Prize of £10,000. The annual prize donated by an anonymous patron of new art was to be awarded to the person who, in the opinion of the new art jury, had made the greatest contribution to art in Britain in the previous 12 months. The Tate Gallery press release quoted in my article, Hot Art, the term of the prize, published by the Radio Times in the 3rd of November, 1984. The jury consisted of Alan Bowness, Felicity Whaley Cohen, Nee Samuel, daughter of Viscount Bearstead, the honorary president and the trustees of the Whitechapel Art Gallery, Nicholas Sorota, director of the Whitechapel, Rudy Fuchs, director of the Van Abbey Museum in Eindhoven, and John McEwen of the Brewing family. The shortlist for the £10,000 award was Malcolm Morley, Richard Deacon, Howard Hodgkin, Richard Long, and Gilbert and George. Morley, then long resident in the US, won, and all the other artists won in subsequent years. A party political broadcast on behalf of the Conceptual Art Party. Bruce's last exhibition with the Anthony Dauphin Gallery was in 1987, is that right? No, 2002. Oh, you had another one. I missed it. I'm sorry. Having been shown by... It Dauphin... wasn't an exhibition. It was a party political broadcast speech. Right. Is this...? Yeah. Yeah. And it's 2002 you did this? There was a year a gallery closed. Right. I didn't actually close the gallery, but it, it was that year. A lot of artists left Dauphin, Gilbert and George, Lucy and Freud, Leon Kossoff, on moral issues. Dauphin was ruthless as well as successful. In 1985, the w very wealthy property developer, Peter Palumbo, became who had been chairman of the trustees of the Whitechapel, was appointed chairman of the Tate trustees by Margaret Thatcher. Palumbo owned houses by Frank Lloyd Wright, Mies van der Rohe in the US, and a Le Capucier house in France. In a full-page newspaper interview shortly after his appointment, Palumbo criticized the conservative approach of the then director of the Tate Gallery, Alan Bowness, and praised the radicalism of the director of the Whitechapel Gallery, Nicholas Sirota. You couldn't do that, and Palumbo had to resign as chair of the Tate trustees that week, and was replaced by, can you believe it, the architect Richard Rogers. Sirota was appointed a year and a half later director of the Tate Gallery. In this period, architects were promoted as important cultural figures, Richard Rogers, Norman Foster, Max Gordon, Will Alsop, and John Poulson. In 1986, the Labour MP Mark Fisher, spokesman on arts and media, and Richard Rogers organised an exhibition at the RA, London as it could be. Their book, A New London, was in retrospect the blueprint for projects such as the Millennium Dome, Tate Modern, and the 2012 London Olympics. The book tells us that in 1991, 400 local authority houses were built in London and 80,000 people were homeless. The National Lottery, a new arm of the gambling industry, 
enabled museum directors and their trustees to plan new palaces of culture. In my opinion, the whole thing was criminal. In 1988, Margaret Thatcher forgave Peter Palumbo and appointed him chairman of the Arts Council. He provided over the drafting of the rules of the allocation of an estimated 20, 200 million a year national lottery funding for good causes of the arts. He stayed in the unpaid job until 1994. Palumbo's committee rejected the proposals put forward by the officers at the Arts Council in cooperation with artist collectives, ACME and SPACE for a grand St. Catherine's Dock style regeneration of derelict industrial buildings for low-cost studios, housing and artist-led galleries throughout Britain. It was at this point that I showed in Norwich um, Bruce McLean's Urban Turban after it had been shown up in Manchester uh, at the Corner House. Urban Turban is, I think, the best account made by an artist of what I've been trying to describe in this lecture. Just turn around and look at the images here. This is the text on the back page. It's set in the Dofe Gallery, and Dofe's assistant, Robin Vosen, plays the dealer. When Dofe closed in 2001, Vosen went to New York to work for Marion Goodman. He's now back in London working for Larry Gargosian. Looking at the most influential dealer on the Tate Exhibitions Program since 1980, it's Dofe, Goodman, and now Gargosian, Pace, and Schwerner. If you look at the Exhibitions Program, the, something like 80% of the artists belong to that group of galleries. Mm. In 1980 and the 1990s, the London art world appeared more regularly on the pages of Vogue, Harper's, Tatler, and the world of interiors than it did in Art Forum. Saatchi showed his sensation collection at the Royal Academy in 1997 through Norman Rosenthal. Michael Craig Martin was a trustee of the Tate Gallery for 10 years between 1989 and 1999. He was the only artist on the committee in those years, and that is the decade between the Freeze exhibition of the YBAs of Goldsmith's Young British Artists and preparations for the opening of Tate Modern in 2000. The new Tate trustees were art collectors, but their real qualification was their money. They replaced the art historians, academics, Tehard in the period as Marxists. The Tate Annual Report in 2013 tells us that all four Tates are governed by a single board of trustees with 14 members. Three of the trustees are youngish artists, and one is an art historian, a 16th century specialist from Leicester. The other ten are businessmen and women, including Rudolf Rupert Murdoch's daughter, who recently gave the Tate a million pounds. I spent a couple of hours with students doing Google searches on their international corporate interests. Even my short rich search suggests that Tate Modern has become a flagship for London to become a world capital of capitalism. So let's all concentrate on Urban Turban. It's a great work by a really serious artist who deserves much more international fame. So let us go and take a look at Urban Turban and listen to the score by Dave Stewart. But one story about Dave Stewart, Bruce told us when we worked with him on Urban Turban in the Norwich Gallery in 1996. Dave Stewart, ex Eurythmics, met Bob Dylan in the States and they got on really well and exchanged addresses. When Dylan was next in London, he asked a driver to take him to the address Stewart had given him in Muswell Hill. They arrived at a row of modest houses, and Dylan rang the bell. A woman came to the door and said, Oh, Bob Dylan. She was surprised. Dylan asked if Dave was in. Yes, she said, but he's in the shower. Come and sit down, and I'll make a cup of tea and call him. She knocked on the bathroom door and told her husband Bob Dylan was waiting for him in the sitting room. 
the, ga the guy came out ashen-faced with a towel wrapped around his waist. Dylan got the wrong part of Muswell Hill and something the man, also called Dave, was soon able to sort out. A mushed up version of Bruce's story was retold inaccurately in either The Guardian or The Observer just a couple of months ago. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, good. Didn't have to interrupt you. What? Didn't have to interrupt you. Didn't Sorry. have to interrupt you. It was good. <laughs>